Good morning, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome to Dillwood Baptist Church. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, or if you're joining us online and we've not met before, my name is Ryan. I'm the pastor here, and we're so delighted that you've joined us as we've gathered on this Lord's Day to worship uh, Jesus Christ and uh, remember his resurrection. We have some, uh, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and call them out. If you'll notice, the man in the blue right here, uh, Terry uh, um, West is with us. They were here a couple years ago. They moved to California, and they are back for a couple weeks, so we're glad to Terry. His family's here too, so hopefully you'll see them before it's all over. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, we, I want us to still our hearts for just a moment before the Lord. So to help us do that, I'm going to read from Psalm 84. Psalm 84. If you have your Bible, I'd invite you to turn there. If not, the text will be on the screen. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the, uh, the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, and they make a place of springs, the early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God and Zion. O God of, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look at the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would, please bow your head with me and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather to you today and we are so thankful uh, for the opportunity to gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ, with whom we stand in one confession upon this reality, namely that your son Jesus Christ lived, died upon the cross for our sins, and rose again from the dead on the third day. And now he sits at your right hand, where he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we come to you today. We entreat your name. We pray that you would join us, God, that you would meet us, that, Father, uh, as we pray prayers, as we sing songs as we read from your scripture and hear it proclaimed, and even as we give of our tithes and of our offerings, Father, we come with thankful hearts, and so we pray that you would receive all of these, that you would be glorified. Father, we also pray that as we sing these songs, that our soul will be stirred, as we hear from your word, that our hearts will be inflamed with zeal for you and for your gospel. We pray that you would transform us now. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Well, as Ryan read, it is uh, better as one day in the courts of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, isn't it? We're going to sing that song together as we begin our time of worship. So would you stand with me as we sing? Let's sing together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the safe the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove. Trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing Lord, just in simple faith to plunge me, be the healing cleansing Lord.
trust him. Precious Jesus, save your friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Let's sing one more time. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Let's sing that again. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, Awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our 
God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. may be seated. Y'all know it's not the first time I forgot my Bible in the pulpit. It won't be the last. Um, our scripture reading today is going to come from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, uh, verses 14 through 30. So again, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn there. Uh, if not, the text will be up on the screen. John, chapter 10, verses 14 through 30. Jesus said this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again." No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of the one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? At the time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We do take comfort in that truth, do we not? That if we belong to Jesus, there's nothing that anyone can do uh, Romans 8 says there's neither height nor depth nor breadth nor width nor anything, no principality nor power, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, and we take comfort in that fact. This is the time in our worship service where we gather uh, to pray for the needs in our church body, and I have a couple of needs I want to share with you today um, for us to be praying for. One, um, tomorrow a couple of things are going on with some of our church members. George Thompson is going to be starting radiation on a uh, just a spot on his neck where they need to just nip a little bit of cancer in the bud. And so we want to pray. He'll go, uh, he'll have 10 rounds of treatment and hopefully will be done in about two and a half weeks. So we want to pray for George and Jane. Uh, also tomorrow, Betty Mosley is having a knee surgery. She tweaked her knee a while back and is having that. It'll be outpatient surgery tomorrow. Uh, so we want to pray for Betty. I want to pray for our brother, Tom Wheeler. He's in a lot of pain right now. Um, good news is that we know his, some of his treatments are working, but uh, he's got other things that are going on that are just causing a lot of pain. So we want to pray for Tom. And then uh, last week, I, I just I want to kind of give the church a, an update on a situation. Uh, last week, if you were here, you know that we dedicated two babies. One was our Leo, and the other one was a little baby named Adige, a unique diamond in Jesus' eyes. And his parents, Deja and Shavante, were here. Well, this past week, they were actually in a pretty bad car accident. Um, and uh, baby was totally fine, nothing wrong with him. Uh, uh, Shavante, the father, had just a little bit of cuts on his face, but Deja actually had some pretty significant injuries. Uh, she's going to be okay, but she, uh, she, she broke her femur and had to have surgery on that on Wednesday. Uh, she also has other injuries related to that. At the same time, she's four months pregnant, and so it's just a lot to handle at one time. And so I just would ask that you pray for their family right now. Um, 
they have a lot going on, and uh, we just want to pray that, that everyone would heal from that accident and that God would provide for everything that they need. So uh, please, please keep them in your prayers. If you would, please bow your head with me and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you today because your Son, Jesus Christ, our shepherd, has led us to you. Just as he is one with you, so he's invited us to participate in the very divine life that you share. Not that we too would become gods, but rather that we would enjoy the fellowship that you have with your Son. God, he laid down his life in order that we might join in that fellowship. What a privilege for us. Not only that we would be forgiven of our sins, that the guilt that we have would not be counted against us, but also that we get to join in the fellowship of the Holy God and of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, as our good shepherd, we come to you looking for help. We've come to your son, Jesus Christ. We want to pray today for those who are suffering And indeed, we know there are many people suffering in our world today, but I want to pray for our church members in particular. For those who are afflicted with cancer, we pray that you would be with them to strengthen them. We pray for Tom Wheeler, that you would uh, help him as he goes through just his rounds of treatment now for some illnesses that he has. We pray that you would be with him, help him to be relieved of his comfort, or uh, relieved of his pain. Um, Father, we also pray for our brother George Thompson as he goes uh, for this radiation treatment tomorrow. We pray that it would be effective, that he would be able to tolerate, tolerate the treatment well. And God, we also pray for Betty Mosley as she prepares for her knee surgery tomorrow. We pray that it would be uh, without incident, that there would be no issue in the surgery, that everything would go smoothly, and that ultimately this would, uh, God, be, uh, the, have the end that Betty is healed and that she's able to walk without pain and get around. Father, we want to pray for this dear, sweet couple who we've only come to know recently as a church, but whom you've given us the privilege to love and to bless. Uh, Father, we pray for the parents. We pray for Deja and ask that as she recovers from her surgery, that you would, um, God, help her to heal. Um, Father, as she looks forward to going to rehab at some time in the next week, we just pray that, again, you would help her to, uh, to not only recover from the surgery and the Um, and the other just injuries that she sustained, but also that you would keep her uh, baby that she's carrying safe and well. We pray for Shivante that you would help him to know how to best care for her during this time and also for uh, their baby Adage, God. Uh, We're so thankful for how you have provided for them in the midst of this, but God, they have still great need for provision. And so we pray for their safety, we pray for their their health and well-being, and we pray for their provision, that you would just, um, just encircle them with your care. God, we want to pray for uh, our community today as we, again, just continue to experience very severe heat. We want to pray for those who uh, just are at risk for heat stroke, for those who, especially those who are homeless, who don't have a cool place to go during the day. Uh, God, we pray that you would protect them, help them to be well. We also pray for students who are out for the summer, that you would help them to be safe in whatever situation they might be coming home to. Uh, and ultimately that they would grow and flourish, God, in a, in a safe family environment, Father, as they travel together as families. We pray that you would uh, be with all of them. Uh, and Father, even, I know this past week, the Metro voted on a budget, God, just even in fiscal matters like that, that they would be wise. We know that uh, as, the, uh, as our city has grown, that there are people who feel pushed out. And um, Father, that uh, even affects some of our church members. So God, we pray that you would Uh, Again, help those who uh, govern here, give them wisdom. Uh, We pray that every week, Father. We pray it for uh, those at our national level, our state level, our local level. So we want to pray for them today, for President Joe Biden, Governor Bill Lee, Mayor John Cooper, all other men and women who serve at any level of the government. Would you give them wisdom, Father? Uh, Father, even this week as we heard news of uh, just a very monumental decision of Roe versus Wade being struck down and uh, Father, uh, as someone who believes that every child that is conceived uh, in the womb every, every, uh, is a baby, is a person who deserves a chance at life, we rejoice at that. But we also pray for those um, mothers now who um, might be pregnant and, and, and fearful. Um, God, we pray that you would continue to equip Christians to mobilize and uh, to, to serve 
parents to be and to love children that come into the world, not just uh, to the point of birth, but even after their birth by caring for them. Uh, Father, we're aware that there are many orphans in our society today, some who have lost their parents, some whom uh, it's just not safe to be with their parents. And so, Father, I pray that you would continue to call many Christians into foster care uh, and into adoption, uh, as I know has already been a ministry that has, um, many have taken up in this church. Father, we pray that you would continue to um, just use us as your people to care for the orphan, the widow, the sojourner, that we might bless them in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. God, as we continue now in the worship of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray that you would be with us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. If you would stand and join with us as we sing. the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your Beautiful sin. 
you, Lindsey and Johnson, for that beautiful hymn. I want to make an announcement before we have a prayer for the offertory. Um, we all of okay. We're all aware of next Sunday. It's our last Sunday with the pastor and Samantha and the boys, and we certainly wish them all the best in the future. But uh, just like we do on Staff Appreciation Sunday, next Sunday can be an opportunity to show them, let them take something with them. So get them a card. If you want to give them something financially, add that in the card next week, and we'll have the basket up here like we had before and bring that with you. So uh, we look forward to a bittersweet next Sunday. Father, we do come to you, Lord, with thankfulness in our hearts, Father. Thankfulness for every blessing you've given us and every opportunity we have in this life. To stand here in your presence, Father, corporately as a body of believers, to worship you and to just like singing that song just a minute ago, Father, where it just, it just glorifies you in every way. And we thank you for the writer of that song and that we can sing it, Father. But most of all, we thank you for our relationship with you, Father. The sacrifice that you gave that all of us may be able to stand here and live in a land that's freedom, full of freedom, and our freedom in you, Father. So right now, as we come to take our offering, we thank you for the privilege of that today. And we pray that what we take will be used to glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. As we pass our offering together, you can be seated. As we pass our offering together, I want to introduce a new song to you. Um, I think that it fits Ryan's message today really well, but I also think that it's a really relevant song for this time of transition that we're in as a church. Uh, I know there's a lot of uncertainty and questions in the days ahead, and sometimes we just start to wonder about things. And this is a great reminder that uh, as we think back on the past in our biblical history, but also uh, in our church's history in those days when we remember God moving in powerful ways, that God's the same today as he was back then. So I hope that this song speaks to you as it did to me when I first heard it. Uh, but I think it'll be a great song to kind of guide us through this, this time that we're uh, encountering as a church. So uh, if you've heard it before, uh, if you maybe saw it on our Facebook page yesterday, feel free to sing along. But otherwise, uh, just listen along, and then I'd love for you to join us whenever you can. On the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations, I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. now to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock 
of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. You heard your children then, you hear your children now. You are the same God, you are the same God, you answer prayers back then, and you will answer now, you are the same God, you are the same God, you were providing then, you are providing now, you are the same God, you are the same God. the same God. You were a healer then. You are a healer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a Savior then. You are a Savior now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Oh God, my God, I need Oh God, my God, I need you now, how I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Would you stand and sing that with me as we sing that chorus again together? Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now, how I Rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. You freed the captives then, you're freeing hearts right now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You touched the lepers then, I feel your touch right now. You are the same God, you are the same God. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit, Almighty River, come and fill me. Thank you, Jonathan and Lindsay, for that new song. If you would remain standing, if you're able, for the reading of God's Word from the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Uh, we've been in Malachi for about six weeks now, six or seven weeks, and so this is our last message in the series, Rekindling the Flame, studying the book of Malachi. Malachi, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. For behold... The day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you, who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, and you shall go out, leaping like calves from the stall. You shall tread down the wicked. For they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree 
of utter destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, would you be with us now? Help me as I speak. Help us as we listen. God, we pray all this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many of you know I'm the middle of three brothers, uh, and as the son in the middle, it meant that I had two times the propensity for mischief. Uh, and it's doubly so because I was bigger than my older brother, so I could bug him, and I was also bigger than my younger brother, so I could bug him, and, and sometimes my older brother could tag along in that. Now, you should know, though, that I was a pretty agreeable child, right? I, I didn't get into a lot of trouble. Uh, I was and still am pretty much a rule follower, but y'all know, even good kids are still sinners, am I right? So, we would get home from school, our mother would be there to get us started on the right foot, but it didn't take long for us to get on the wrong foot. Uh, we might get into an argument, could be about toys, who gets to play the video game, who gets to pick the TV show to watch, whatever it might be, we'd squabble, there would be yelling, yelling, shouting, tears, Maybe a toy broken, and then mom would have to intervene. Now, my mother was and is a very capable woman, but whenever you're three on one, you can't always manage the whole situation. But if she couldn't control us, there's always one thing that she could say that would stop us dead in our tracks. If she uttered these six words, wait until your father comes home. Yeah, you've heard it before. Maybe you've even said it before. That was it. <laughs> the squabbling would cease most of the time. And we knew even if we stopped then, there likely would be something to happen later on. But it would be even worse if we persisted in our pestering, if we even escalated things further. I mean, you didn't want to be there. Now, again, in this scenario, my, my brothers and I, we were perpetuating wrong against one another. We were perpetuating injustice. And both of my parents, they loved us well. All right, they disciplined us. And discipline always, we need to remember, that's a, that's a twofold piece. Right? There's always instructive discipline. We often forget about that when we talk about discipline. Instructive discipline, it's like an athlete who wants to discipline their body so that they can be at the peak performance. Or maybe a scholar who wants to discipline her mind in order that she might think clearly and accurately that's instructive discipline, but there's also corrective discipline, where sometimes punitive measures must be taken to help us in growing, right? And my, my, you know, my parents are great parents, but if dad came home and had to set, sort things out, you knew you were going to lose some type of a privilege, right? You either had to go to your room, or you had to lose a toy, or the TV might actually be hauled out, or one TV would be hauled out of the living room, not to be seen for another month. That happened before. And sometimes as we live in the world today, we might identify with one of those three parties. We might be like the mother who's just trying to kind of keep things together. You're trying to allow there to be harmony for people to work together. Sometimes we and others are those like the children causing injustice. We're wronging others and one another. And we long for the father to return and to make things right at an imminent time. Right? We knew dad was always going to come home. He always did. Right? It was just a matter of when. Well, this is analogous to some degree to our belief in a Christian hope. Remember what hope is. Hope is not just uh, wishful thinking. I, I really hope that after church today we'll go to my favorite restaurant. That's a wish. No, hope is an expectation about a promise that God has given. And one thing that we long for is that time whenever God comes back and makes all things right. In order for us to experience that reality, though, to live in a perfect world, it does mean that God has to rid the world of evil. And all those who've refused to cease their evil doings, to yield to the Lord, will be caught up, we're told, in the judgment. That's what the Bible tells us. And as, as we've gone through the book of Malachi, we kind of get to the, the, to the postlude today. We saw that there were several disputes that Malachi brought to the people on behalf of the Lord, because they had lost their love for him. 
Remember the very first words were, I have loved you, says the Lord, because they didn't think that was true. And that led them in, the, in their kind of time of less prosperity to kind of withhold things from God and from others that they should have been giving. They didn't tithe. They didn't bring the right type of animals to the sacrifice. The priests weren't teaching them. They were complaining that God really loved injustice more than he loved justice. But it did take a while. We got through all of those disputes. And then finally we saw that God leaves a remnant for his people. If you read through the Bible, you always need to see that there will be a remnant. That is, a people, a group of faithful people who don't abandon their fidelity to the Lord even whenever it seems like everyone else has. You might remember that scene in the book of 1 Kings when the prophet Elijah had just finished his showdown with the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. And you know that Jezebel, the queen of Israel at the time, was not happy about that. And she put out a hit on Elijah. Right? I want his head here tomorrow afternoon. And so he, I mean, he did what a lot of us would do if the, you know, the, the monarch had put a hit on us. He, he ran away. And he goes all the way to Mount Sinai, sometimes called Mount Horeb, and he encounters God there. And he says this in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14. He says to God, I've been, very, I've been very jealous for the Lord, for Yahweh, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars, and they've killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. God, everyone else has abandoned you. I'm the only one you've got. And even now they're trying to take me. What are you going to do about that? Well, if you know the story, you know God does something about that. But one of the things that God does is he reminds Elijah that no, you know, I'm using you, but don't let your head get too big, Elijah. You're not the only one there. He says in verse 18, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. There is a remnant, and that's what Malachi is aiming to do. And so what we get to the in Malachi 3.16, what God says is that there's a book of remembrance written. In the names of those who fear the Lord, God knows them. And we need to take that as a promise. That if we trust God and we love him, if we've submitted ourselves unto Jesus Christ by faith, that God knows our name, brothers and sisters, even if it seems like no one else does. The works that we do in secret, remember what Jesus said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Don't pray your good works before man. Sometimes people don't see those. But we know that God knows and that he's faithful. And so what are we to do then? We're, we know that God has a book with our names written in it. What do we do until that day when the Lord returns? Well, I think that Malachi 4, it's important. If you hold, hold your Bible, right? I've got Malachi chapter 4, turn the page. Matthew chapter 1, this is a pretty important book in the Bible. What are the people to do as they wait for God to act? Here's what I hope you'll see as we bring this series to a close at the end of the book of Malachi. That having experienced God's discipline and salvation, God's people live in hope by clinging to the promises of God, looking forward to the return of the Son, and living joyfully in the Holy Spirit. Let me say that one more time. Having experienced God's discipline and salvation, God's people live in hope by clinging to the promises of God, looking forward to the return of His Son, as they live joyfully in the Holy Spirit. Well, as you see in our text today, the first thing we see is that we need to celebrate God's judgment and his salvation. We need to celebrate God's judgment and his salvation. Remember what the words my, father, my mother said to me, wait until your father comes home. Basically, that's what God says, wait until I show up, because when I show up, I'm going to make things right. Look, look at verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. That day is coming, shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, that it will leave neither root nor branch. It's not, it's not inappropriate to say God's wrath in this passage acts like an incinerator, incinerator, burning all of its proponents, of the sin in its proponents. Now, one thing I want to say about this, y'all know that I'm, I'm very eager to work with Christians of other stripes. I, I like hanging out with Baptists, but I also like hanging out with Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Anglicans. I've even quoted a Roman Catholic a time or two in a sermon. And there are important differences between those denominations, which are not immaterial. However, 
There's one belief that I think can kind of cross all these denominational lines, and it doesn't matter if you're a Baptist or not, or if you're a Presbyterian or not, there are people who affirm this and there are people who don't. And I think it's important that we believe it because it's in the Bible, namely, a belief in God's wrath. A belief in God's wrath. And I'm not talking about a God who is constantly angry, burning with fury at the world for everything that they've done all the time. I've sometimes been asked, well, Brother Ryan, we used to hear a lot more hellfire and brimstone sermons. How come we don't hear those as much? from you or from others. But doesn't it seem like that's what we need to win the world to Christ, to set people straight? I think it's because people sometimes grew up hearing sermons like that, grew up thinking that God is just angry at them all the time. When I talk to Christians who are uh, older than I am, um, I, I can think of so, several conversations like this I've had with people who grew up in church, maybe they're 50 or in their late 40s now, maybe older, and they haven't gone in a long time and they talk to me. They, they find out I'm a pastor, and if they know me or they know Samantha, sometimes they'll, they'll open up a little bit more. You know, if you meet them in the grocery line, they don't open up. But if you meet them and they know you, they'll open up a little bit. And they say, you know, I, I don't go to church a lot anymore, but I still love God. But, I, you know, I grew up in, this, in some Christian tradition, and all I heard was that God was angry. And I live with constant guilt and anxiety about God, and I don't feel like I'm ever worthy to stand before him. Now, I believe in those churches that it was said that Jesus saves you, but what this person is saying to me is that I don't, when I hear the church, I don't think of the gospel as good news. I think of it as bad news. Instead of believing that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, they just heard, you better turn or burn. Now, again, I think that of preaching that is exclusively focused on the wrath of God. And often, if you go see someone preaching on the street with a microphone, that's normally the only part people hear because they walk up to it on the street and they keep walking. And that's all they hear. They don't know the good news. And so I do believe this fact, right, that God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ has sent his son Jesus to be the savior of the world, but also the Bible teaches this, to be the judge of all the world. Right, Jesus came and there are some people who then fall off on the other side. Well, you know, this God who's revealed himself in Jesus, gentle and lowly, is he wouldn't be angry, would he? Well, those people just haven't really read what Jesus said. Jesus spoke about judgment more than he spoke about heaven. Right? We, he did dine with sin. He received tax, collector, tax collectors and sinners and ate with them. But the Bible does say that he is the Son of God who will come one day to judge the world. Revelation 19 portrays him as one coming in to ride on a white horse who's going to defeat the kings of the world who are opposed to the Lord. We read about this in Psalm 2. This image is picked up several times in the Bible to talk about Jesus, namely that one day the Son of God will break them, that is, the kings of the earth who rebel against God, break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. We were assured that God has a day, a day whenever he's appointed for Jesus to come and to, li to deliver his people. Right? The Bible sometimes refers to it as the day, sometimes the day of the Lord. But that's how Jesus actually spoke about it. Right? We need to remember that the gospel is good news, and it's because the one who, to whom judgment has been handed over laid his life down for us. Do you remember we read that a moment ago? I want you to Go to, with me to John chapter 5, verses 25 through 29. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, he's granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he's given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming... All who hear, who are in the tombs, will hear his voice and come out. Those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment. That's language that's picked up straight out of the book of Daniel. Go to Daniel 7, go to Daniel chapter 12 and 13, and you'll see those images of the Son of Man that Jesus speaks about. But again, Jesus, yes, he is the judge, but he's the judge who came, lived, laid down his life, and who rose again. He bore the wrath of God for us in order that we might not have to. This is the good news of the gospel. Nevertheless, there is still a day. 
The Bible talks about the day of the Lord, and if I had to define it one way, I'd use this definition from my seminary professor, Paul House, that the day of the Lord is the day that at specific times through specific events, God's rule will be reestablished on earth, and the elect will be released from sin's sources, adherence, and effects now and or forever. It's not just a one-time event. It's something that God can do at multiple times throughout history. And we'll do one time on capital T, capital D, the day, a day that we don't know when it's going to happen. And again, we might say, why are we talking about this? We need to know ourselves that there's a day coming whenever all evildoers will have to answer before the Lord. Whenever someone takes advantage of any human being, they need to know that there's a day where they will have to answer to God for what they've done. Whenever someone abuses their power, their political office, their position of authority in order to harm others and in order to use it for their own gain, they need to know God has a day. And if you read the book of Romans chapter 1, it's interesting because it's not just like the most heinous sins that are accounted here. Romans 1 says, yes, the murderers, the evildoers, the thieves, all of those will be judged, but also the gossips, and also the people who are disobedient to their parents, and also the boastful and the haughty, they will answer before the Lord on that day. However, the good news of the gospel is that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we're already answered for on that day. And I want us to go from verse 1 now to verse 2 in the book of Malachi chapter 4. But as for you who fear my name, and this is the key, do we fear God, fearing him in faith, not in terror, but in faith and in reverence. For you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Right? Our joy and our life is in God, not just now, but for forever. The Son of Righteousness shall rise. This refers to both God's saving righteousness in Christ, but also His justice, righting the wrongs of the world. You should know that in Greek and in Hebrew, the words justice and righteousness always have the same root. They're not two totally divorced concepts. They're always held together. So the Son of Righteousness shall rise and will bring healing. We will receive forgiveness and we will be able to have fellowship with the Lord. And again, it's such that, you know, a metaphor that in the room maybe only Kenneth Reader has ever experienced before, but the calves will go leaping forth from the stall with joy. You get freedom now. Go to pasture. Go have fun. Like any children that like to play in the grass. And so we get to celebrate the judgment and salvation of God. Now verse 3 goes saying, and they will trample down the wicked and they will be like ashes under their feet. But again, the ashes are from God's wrath, not our own. We need to always remember that. God has not called on us to execute the judgment. He's handed that over to the Son. Our call is to be faithful in the here and now. So we celebrate God's judgment and salvation. We don't want to hide behind it. And again, I think this is very critical as we try to define the people of the world are going to ask us, what kind of Christians are y'all? They, that's a loaded question. You might always want to step back from that question at first because you never know what they're expecting. They're going to, they're going to wonder, are you, a, you know, are you a Bible thumper, turn or burn kind of person who only wants to tell me I'm going to hell. That's what they think we are, by the way. We proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we do believe that God's wrath is coming, but that we might be saved in Jesus. So we celebrate this. We don't want to hide, we don't want to be embarrassed by it. But we celebrate the judgment and salvation of the, of the Lord. The second thing that Malachi exhorts the people to do today is to keep God's good commands. To keep God's good commands. Look at verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb, that is at Sinai, at Horeb for all Israel. I mentioned, this is kind of the last book in the, in the Old Testament, right? Happened, preached around 400 B.C., about 400 years before Jesus was born into the world. And you might wonder, okay, on the, on the last page of the book, what should they be doing? How, what, how would we conduct ourselves until the Lord comes? Well, God's word is to keep the law. You know, there are some laws that we have on the books that we don't keep. Uh, you know, I read that in Salem, West Virginia, it's against the law to eat candy. 
less than an hour and a half before a church service. And it's a good thing Peter's not in the room to hear that one, guys. It's a blue law. You've got to honor the Sabbath. So that's an old law. It's still on the books. In some parts of rural Pennsylvania, if you're driving in a, in a rural area at nighttime, you're supposed to stop every mile and send up a rocket signal so that people know you're coming. Now, it's still on the books. You may, I, I, read, I, I, I kid you not, I read this this week. Now, in rural Pennsylvania, I promise you, they do not do that. You know, maybe on the 4th of July, but no other time. They don't do that, but it's still on the books. And we might think a law like that, okay, do we really need to uphold it or not? If someone brought that case, unless the judge decided to throw it out, the law is still on the books. Right? There are other laws that are old that we really keep. Whenever Samantha and I, uh, back in uh, about five years ago, we had the chance to go to London, England, and uh, they, they still were celebrating, two years after the fact, the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. Now, you might not know what that is, but it was a document that was written in 1215 A.D. that limited the power of the monarchs in England. And it's kind of what, one of the kind of those first human rights declarations that people will point to because it restricted the power of the government. It made sure that individuals had certain rights that could not be totally taken advantage of. And they were still making a big deal of it because it still mattered. Well, as Malachi prophesies, about 800 to 1,000 years after Moses had been given the law to the people, the people were wondering, what should we do? All those things about making sure we bring the right sacrifice to the temple, do we need to do that? And is that really still important? If you read Malachi, you know, yes, it is still very important because the Lord does not change. And again, that's good news for us, not bad news. So we are to remember the law of the Lord, to continue to hold his word. Again, I think there's sometimes we read the Bible, we read parts of the law that are confusing to us, sometimes genuinely puzzling and troubling to us, and we think, that's just, we either think it's silly or we're always thankful it doesn't apply to us today. But we should remember it and remember that the law of the Lord is good and that there is wisdom in that. Even if Jesus has fulfilled the law, it's still good that we know it. And that's why we privilege as Christians, and I would say especially as Baptists, Reading, studying, memorizing God's word. Again, it's sometimes, you know, marveling. I'm sometimes marvel when I talk to people about the Bible and they'll say something. Well, you know, doesn't it say in the Bible, you know, that it's important that we, you know, have a concealed carry firearm? Aren't you glad? I'm like, no, 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 no. Okay, that's, that's a separate constitutional discussion. That's not, but you need to know that's not in the Bible. I mean, you know, I'm not saying it's unimportant. I'm just saying let's read the Bible, you know, from the beginning to the end. You don't read that. Well, don't you know how it says, you know, God loves those who help themselves. He helps those who help themselves. No, read the Bible. That's not there. That's not there. We need to not only read it for wisdom, but also for instruction. Look at Psalm 19, one of the great Psalms that helps us memorize, meditate upon the word of God. It says the law, verse 7 through 11, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, and the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant ward, and in keeping them there is great reward." So as it was important for Malachi then, it's important for us today. 2,000 years on the other side of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we memorize and hold to and cling to the word of God. So we celebrate the Lord's judgment and salvation. We keep God's good commandments. And finally, we need to grasp towards God's future reconciliation. We grasp towards God's future reconciliation. I need to wrap up, so I'm going to speak fast. Verses 5 and 6. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Elijah's going to come, and he's going to preach a message of repentance. If you read the Gospels, you know that whenever John the Baptist came, that's exactly what he did. Before Jesus showed up, before that day of the Lord, he was there to call the people of Israel to repent before the Lord. And Jesus himself says in Matthew 11 that Elijah is to come. I tell you, Elijah is John the Baptist. 
He was the one who was to come to prepare the people. But I want to focus quickly on that bit about turning the hearts of fathers to their sons and of sons to their fathers. And we, we can take the gender out of that, of children to their parents and of parents to their children. One of the unique pains that I've noticed as I've been able to live as a human being, but also to pastor and to care for people who are going through very difficult moments, is that one of the most unique forms of hurt someone can feel is whenever there is a bad relationship between a parent and a child. Whether, especially whichever party is in the right, they want to be restored, but sometimes it's impossible. And this is one of those things that really kind of grows up as we age and become mature adults. It's hard. The vision the Bible has is that a family is a cohesive unit, not just a mother, father, and their however many kids are in the household, but from generation to generation, we pass down the faith. Right? As we're thinking of a forever faithfulness is the title of my sermon today, we have to think not just about what I believe today and having a good time today, I have to think about tomorrow and next year and the next decade. And so whenever God's messenger comes, he's going to bring reconciliation between parents and children, and children and parents. This is something that I mentioned we grasp towards this. Because not only this type of reconciliation, but all of the reconciliation that's spoken about in the Bible, we know, will not be fully affected until that day when the Lord Jesus returns. However, we grasp for that. We long for it. We work for that because we want to experience the blessing that God has for us. He's in it for the generations. As in it, he's in it for us. Remember this. Having experienced God's discipline and salvation, God's people live in hope by clinging to the promises of God, looking forward to the return of the Son, and living joyfully in the Holy Spirit. The way in which we can enjoy all of this is mentioned in our text today is by fearing the Lord. And again, not a fear that is worried about judgment. 1 John chapter 4 says, There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out all fear. If we know the Lord, if we've confessed our sins, knowing that he has been faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, then we have no fear. We've trusted Jesus Christ. And and even today, if you've not believed in Jesus Christ, you can do so by confessing your sins to the Lord, turning in faith and repentance, and receiving, the Bible tells us, eternal life. You receive much more than that. You receive a family. You receive an inheritance. If you'd like to pray today, I'll be standing down front in just a minute. Jonathan's going to come sing a song of response. But if you would, please bow your heads with me. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come today and we thank you for the chance to hear from your word. God, we hear the necessary word of judgment that the Bible tells us about, that we must proclaim, that we must believe. And Father, understanding that judgment is partially a good thing because it means that you are ridding the world of evil. But God, we do pray, not only for us, but even for those whom we love, that you would bring many men and women to repentance. Your word says in 2 Peter chapter 3 that one reason you've waited so long in sending Jesus, your son, back to earth is in order that men and women might come to repentance, that they might have more time. We know there's a day whenever he's due to return, but until that time, help us to be faithful as stewards of the story to proclaim the gospel message. And God, we also pray for our own hearts that you would help us, God, to love your law, that we would uh, enjoy the salvation that you are giving us, but also that we would be ministers of reconciliation, which is indeed what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 calls us as Christians. Father, help us to engage in this ministry ourselves, to help to heal the wounds that sin has caused upon the world as we live in faith and in hope. God, we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Well, as we consider Ryan's message this morning, we think about God's forever faithfulness. Uh, Let's stand and sing a song together, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Would you stand and sing with me? Thou hast been 
seated. Um, thank you again for everyone who has joined us today. And uh, before we go, I have just a couple announcements I'd like to share with you. Uh, first, just announcements for this upcoming week. We've got our Wednesday night Bible study this Wednesday at six o'clock. We'll meet in the fireside room and we're going to be concluding our series. We've been uh, going through on the Apostles Creed and uh, going to be talking a little bit about eternity together this Friday as we or this Wednesday as we talk about the uh, the life everlasting and the resurrection of the body. So I hope you'll join us for that as we conclude that series. Also, our youth group are, is going to meet this Wednesday uh, here in the Christian Life Center, also at 6 o'clock. Um, next Sunday, two things are happening. First, uh, we're going to have, uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. It's the first Sunday of the month. We've been doing that this year in 2022. Uh, so take this time to prepare your heart to receive that meal from the Lord. And also, as Steve mentioned earlier, there's going to be a fellowship meal uh, after church next Sunday. So uh, if, you would like to partic- if you'd like to come, we, we hope you will. The church is going to provide meat, drinks, and buns. If you would like to bring a side or a dessert, um, please, well, first off, if you're going to come, just RSVP. But we, we invite everyone to bring a side or a dessert so that uh, we can uh, just enjoy one another's uh, food together. So uh, I think that's all that I have. Um, We're going to sing one more, uh, we're going to sing that chorus one more time, but if you would, please bow your head with me and let us pray. God, your faithfulness is great. Um, Father, from generation to generation, you have been the same. Father, uh, you are the God of our fathers, we say, and we believe that for all who have preceded us in death and faith. uh, Father, they're with you now. God, we look forward to the day when we'll join them. But until that time, God, you've given us work here to do on earth, so help us this week to live and do acts of justice and mercy, Father, to um, uh, walk humbly with you as we, um, as we uh, serve one another, God. Uh, help us to love our neighbor as ourself. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Well, we sang the first two verses of Great is Thy Faithfulness just a minute ago. Let's stand and sing that third together, and then we'll be dismissed. Have a great week.